Today, it's not fashionable to be addicted to drugs. In fact, most drug addicts end up in jail. But did you know that drug addiction is the sole reason that we have Coca-Cola today? I bet you didn't. This is Munchables, and today we're going to be looking at the story behind Coca-Cola. The story of Coca-Cola started like most stories start. It started with one man, John Stith Pemberton. Pemberton was born July 8, 1831, in Knoxville and did most of his growing up in Rome, Georgia. He proved to himself to be a brilliant student and was able to attend the Reform Medical College of Georgia in Macon, Georgia. By the time he was 19, he had already earned his medical degree. Do you know how ridiculously brilliant a person has to be to earn a medical degree by 19? Probably as ridiculously brilliant as a person has to be to invent a drink as widely accepted as Coca-Cola. But let's move on. We have some Civil War action to catch. Pemberton practiced medicine for a while, but his heart wasn't really in it. His main talent was chemistry, and he wanted more than anything to be a chemist. He decided that he would pursue a career that aligned with his interests and not medicine. That's why he moved to Columbus and opened a drugstore. For a while, Pemberton had a pretty normal life. He sold drugs, ran his shop, and got married. In fact, he started to raise a family. It was a boring life, sure, but it was a pretty normal one. Some may say Pemberton was living the American dream. He had his own business, was wildly prosperous, and he had his family to go home to at night. However, the events of 1861 opened another chapter in his otherwise boring life. It was the year of the Civil War, and even certified doctors were not exempt from the draft. Pemberton got drafted into the Confederate Army, and that single act would lead to a series of events that would eventually birth Coca-Cola. Pemberton served in the 3rd Cavalry Battalion of Georgia State Guard and was industrious enough to achieve the rank of Lieutenant Colonel. For the most part of the war, Pemberton was relatively safe. He saw his share of combat, but he never really came close to dying. Relatively, of course. However, by the last year of the war, his luck ran out and he became injured, and it was via a saber wound to the chest. Down on his luck and reeling from his wounds, Pemberton returned home. His wound failed to heal and it was extremely painful to deal with. His doctors recommended that he use morphine to get over the pain and he heeded their advice. Unfortunately, after a few years, Pemberton discovered that he was essentially a drug addict. He'd become addicted to morphine. Now, ordinarily, this addiction wouldn't be terrible news, but morphine isn't just a highly addictive opiate. It also has some nasty side effects. For example, he began having headaches, abdominal cramps, and depression. Pemberton immediately saw that he could not continue with morphine usage if he wanted to continue living his life in happiness. But he was struck with a huge dilemma. He couldn't endure his pain, so he needed a painkiller. But he couldn't continue using morphine as a painkiller because it was terribly addictive. To solve this problem, Pemberton decided to put his knowledge of chemistry to work. He decided that he would create his own painkiller, one that didn't need morphine to work. And that's how he created Coca-Cola. The journey to getting what we now know as the Coca-Cola formula wasn't easy. Pemberton tried several opium-free painkillers. His first recipe was something called Dr. Tuggles Compound Syrup of Globe Flour, a syrup made from Cephalanthus occidentalis, a toxic plant that is commonplace in Alaska. He even attempted to sell the first syrup as a drug. He marketed it as a drug that could cure bronchitis, pneumonia, and all kinds of lung disease. Fortunately, the drug wasn't very successful, and he went back to finding the perfect opium-free painkiller. He decided to start experimenting with coca and coca wines. Fortunately, one day he stumbled upon a recipe that had extracts of domania and cola nut and had a unique taste. More like the Coca-Cola of today. Pemberton was relieved. He'd finally found a solution to his problem, but he didn't immediately name it Coca-Cola. Nope. He named it Pemberton's French Wine Cola. Weird, right? I'll tell you what's weirder. We've discovered that people who like this video and subscribe to the channel have up to 10 years of amazing luck. Don't believe us? Try it and see. It really works. Now, back to Pemberton and the unnaturally long first name of what we now know 
as Coca-Cola. The year was 1885, and Pemberton was glad that his quest was successful. He'd invented a substitute for morphine, and he would finally be able to wean himself off the drug. He registered his new drug, Pemberton's French Wine Cola, at Pemberton's Eagle Drug and Chemical House, a drugstore that he owned. He marketed his new drug as a patent drug. In Pemberton's days, patent drugs were drugs that could cure almost any disease. They were unregulated and marketers didn't have to confirm that the drugs were indeed effective. But even then, Pemberton's French wine cola wasn't meant to last. The very next year, prohibition legislation was passed in Atlanta and Fulton County. Since Pemberton's French wine cola I have to say, it's getting really draining to fully say the name of this drug slash syrup slash beverage. Seriously, it's like eight syllables or nine. It's hard to say at this point. Wait, where were we? Yes, this drug had alcohol as one of its ingredients. Pemberton had to rework the recipe. And he did, but even this was by accident. When trying to make the beverage, he accidentally blended the base syrup with carbonated water. The result was what he called Coca-Cola, the temperance drink. However, the name Coca-Cola didn't come about easily. As you'll notice, it's quite a leap to go from Pemberton blah 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 to Coca-Cola in one fell swoop. The name came up when Pemberton's bookkeeper, Frank Robinson, suggested it. He said instead of naming it Coca-Cola because of its coca leaves and the African cola nut, it would be better to name it Coca-Cola. Why? Because Coca-Cola looks better than Coca-Cola. And to be honest, he was right. To prove his point to Pemberton, he wrote Coca-Cola in the following red print that is now known with the brand. Pemberton was convinced and decided that he would name the drink Coca-Cola. Now, John Stith Pemberton wasn't only a clever chemist. He was also an astute businessman. He knew that the temperance movement had a following. So he marketed Coca-Cola as a drug and a drink that could replace alcohol. But we're not quite there yet. This version of Coca-Cola still had cocaine as one of its ingredients. Yes, you heard that right. The United States government saw it fit to ban alcohol, but figured that cocaine was basically powdered aspirin. Smart. What Pemberton sold as a temperance drink in 1885 still had a lot of years before it could reach its final form. The form we now love and enjoy. But let's go back to the story, shall we? As expected, sales picked up, and a glass of Coca-Cola was first sold for five cents a glass. But Pemberton's destiny wasn't to run Coca-Cola. He'd already played the part he was meant for, and as fate would see it, his chapter was coming to a close. Soon after the marketing of Coca-Cola, Pemberton fell really ill, and he was nearly bankrupt. One of the reasons for this is that despite his success with Coca-Cola, he was still very addicted to morphine, an extremely expensive drug. Low on money, he decided that he would sell the Coca-Cola business to someone else. That someone else was Asa Griggs Candler, the man that would take Coca-Cola to another level entirely. Pemberton didn't really want to sell his business. In fact, he knew that there was a chance that Coca-Cola would become the national drink of the United States. But he didn't have much of a choice. His health was waning, and he was in dire need of money, so he sold the formula of his drink. Asa Griggs Candler, the buyer of the formula, paid $1,750 US dollars for it. In today's money, that may be ridiculously low, but when adjusted for inflation, it's actually $47,298. Well, that's still low to be fair, but it isn't embarrassingly so. That same year, Pemberton died from stomach cancer. He was 57. Ordinarily, Coca-Cola would have died with him, but the company didn't. It was in the hands of Asa Griggs Candler, the marketing guru that would eventually change the destiny of the drink. Asa Griggs Candler had big dreams for Coca-Cola, and immediately he purchased the formula of the drink and the rights to the name Coca-Cola. He got to work. In 1892, he founded the Coca-Cola Company and trademarked the brand a year later. Coca-Cola was proving to be a huge success already, as Asa Candler was focused on consolidation. By 1895, Coca-Cola was sold nationwide. In 1899, he started exporting the drink to neighboring countries like Cuba, and he developed the famous $1 contract in the same year. This contract famously gave companies the right to bottle Coca-Cola for sale 
for just a dollar. At first, Asa Candler continued marketing Coca-Cola as a beverage that doubles as a drug that could relieve mental and physical fatigue. But soon, he saw that people bought Coca-Cola because it was sweet, not because it worked like medicine. In 1903, he made one of the biggest changes to the formula of Coca-Cola. He removed the cocaine. He sold the extracted cocaine to pharmaceutical companies instead and sold the drink without a trace of the drug. He found that it really had no effect on sales and continued to sell it that way, and thus, the taste evolution of Coca-Cola was complete. It had gone from syrup that was meant to work like morphine to a beverage that was enjoyed for its taste. It had gone from Pemberton's French wine cola to Coca-Cola. It had gone from a drink sold in a lonely drugstore in Atlanta to a drink sold nationwide. But the corporate evolution of Coca-Cola wasn't done yet. The Coca-Cola company hadn't yet reached its final form. On September 12, 1919, Asa Candler sold the Coca-Cola company to a group of investors for $25 million. The company got reincorporated and 500,000 shares of the company were offered for $40 per share. The 1920s proved to be the decade that turned Coca-Cola into a real global brand. It was in the 20s that the company almost unilaterally invented the idea of Santa Claus. Oh, you didn't know that? Half of what we know as Christmas today was invented by Coca-Cola as a marketing tactic. Yes, that includes the Santa and his coat of red and white. Today, the Coca-Cola company, or franchise, is one of the largest in the world. Just how large? Well... All of 57 billion servings of all kinds of beverages drank each day, besides water, over 3% are trademarked or licensed by Coca-Cola. In fact, the Coca-Cola company makes so many drinks that if you drank one per day, it would take you roughly nine years to try them all. The drink is, without a doubt, the most distributed beverage in the world, though Pemberton thought that his invention would become a national drink. and. He was wrong. It became a worldwide drink. This snack brand was sent in by a subscriber. If you really want to know about the origin of your favorite snack, simply send it to us. Who knows? You may be lucky enough. We may decide to make a video on your favorite snack brand. That's all for today, guys. Remember to like this video and subscribe to the channel for more lit content. This is Munchables. Goodbye and stay safe.